Hi, welcome back to the AI in Action video series. Today we are really lucky to be here with Professor Zhao. Um, he is an associate professor at Carnegie Mellon University and director of the AI Safe Lab, where his work focuses on developing human-centric um, and trustworthy AI solutions. Um, I'm sure we're going to learn a lot more, but at first I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be here. We really appreciate it. Um, so our first question was a bit about kind of what sparked your passion for AI and um, its intersection with safety and engineering? Well, you know, when I started as a PhD student, uh, I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so at that time, I, I my guess is uh, self-driving self -driving car mm -hmm. uh, is coming. Uh, but I, what I didn't know is that Google self-driving car is, is already launched at that time. It just launched this program, but it's confidential. Um, but then I also understand that uh, as a PhD student, I may not be able to compete with the, the tech, tech giant. So uh, I just asked what, what kind of question I can help the community to answer. And the one thought I have is um, who will give the permission? So for, for example, if Ford, um, GM, uh, Uber, um, Bosch, um, Rolls Royce, they all have their own self-driving cars. Who will give them permission to put their cars on the public road? And uh, what, what if someone just you know, made a, like, um, like a very uh, simple self-driving car uh, in their garage for a week and you know, put it on the public street, that will be very risky. So I think we do need some technologies to, um, to certificate and assess the, the readiness of the technology. And then I realized this is actually a very challenging question because um, we are dealing with very small probability. Because for human, the collision rate is about two fatalities per 100 millimiles. And 100 millimiles is a very long distance and very costly. So the probability for a successful rate is actually very, very high. Mm -hmm. It's 99.99. Usually, like 10, the error, uh, we need to reduce the, this kind of risk to the usually in the scale of 10 to the power of negative seven or something. And you know now this this wave of AI, based on we have sufficient data, but for safety we actually do not. We shouldn't have sufficient data for bad accidents, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so this is a small probability, and is what I call rare event safety. And it's actually the core challenge for us to deploy AI products on a large scale to really help the, the major society. So I think that's actually why you know, I start this self-driving car, uh, sorry, this self-driving car journey, and also why I launched the AI safety, uh, mm -hmm. safety AI lab at SMU. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of following on from that, if you could briefly um, tell us about some of the projects you're working on at yeah. the safety AI lab and some of your favorite things that you um, done. Excellent. So one of the current uh, projects we're working on is under support of Department of Transportation uh, is we are making the digital twin of Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. And you know, after we make this digital twin of Pittsburgh, we can analyze uh, the intersections and infrastructure of Pittsburgh and see how that, what, what we can do to uh, the infrastructures uh, to improve the safety for human driven vehicles, but also for the future, prepare for the future auto autonomous vehicles. Uh, in addition to that, we're also building a test ground. Um, it's about like a half an hour drive from Pittsburgh, um, also under support of DOT. In this case, we have the self-driving car uh, testing ground to give certificate to the cars uh, in Pennsylvania and help to really allow the small companies to have a kind of protection for them because we um, can provide this uh, certific certification service, assessment service for them to help them to, them to measure their risks. So I think that's really, I'm really excited about this project because we are, after years of uh, research on this, we finally deploy this to the real world. You know, I participate in the building of world's first uh, self-driving car print ground called Amp City mm -hmm. with my uh, PhD advisor, Hui Peng, um, like Michigan. Um, but now I think we are really making the effort to have a much larger scale uh, and provide the service to the society. So yeah, I think I'm very excited about it. What do you think the most rewarding or memorable AI project that you worked on has been? Well, there are many projects I've been working on. For example, uh, robots can help system uh, elder people. Uh, a robot can really help like working the same daycare and you know, have to clean up the toys on the ground, um, many self-driving cars. But the one thing I'm really, uh, I was very excited is that when I just joined SMU six years ago, um, just few weeks, a few months before I joined SMU, Uber has this world's first fatal accident, unfortunately, uh, in Phoenix. 
and uh, because that Uber halted all its uh, fleet, and uh, um, and uh, my team was the first team Uber invited uh, around the world to help them to improve their system. So we worked together for about a year, and you know after a few months this accident happened. You know we make a study system, we help them to develop new technologies, and eventually we uh, bring the business back to normal, and continue this journey. I think this is a really uh, exciting for me because I'm feeling at that time I might say we are feeling we are making history because mm. you know, we're observing this his, you know this accident and we're trying to fix the problem for a real um, more emergent issue. So I think that's something I'm really memorable for me. What is something unexpected that happened in your career that you're glad happened? COVID nineteen is something really unexpected for everybody you know in the world and it's a it's a big it's a it's it's, it's a really disturbance. Um, so, um, and to me, it's also special because, um, you know, my wife got pregnant at that time and will give birth during the COVID. And she started to have some chest pain at that time. Um, it's, we really met a dilemma because, uh, you know, at that time, the hospital is overwhelmed, right? So uh, we need to make a decision whether we want to go to the hospital uh, and get checked, but have a risk of, um, you know, being contaminated. Um, and, 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 you know, COVID, like pregnant women are very vulnerable from the COVID. So, um, or we stay at home and observe, but we may miss the opportunity to um, have some treatment. So this is really the dilemma we met. Um, and, uh, you, know, as, you know, but never underestimate a desperate husband mm -hmm. who is also a professor. Who, <laughs> so I think I turned to research. So I just educated myself crazily about this uh, cardiac disease stuff. And we, we, we bought some, you know, all the equipment that's allowable for us to purchase as uh, patients. Um, and also, you know, the place I, I live, uh, we have the, the neighborhood, one third of them are, are doctors. So actually, I post some, uh, like, this kind of, like, a, uh, messages on our Facebook forum and say, who, who, are, who, are, who are doctors in food physiologists? I, I have some questions, you know. Is, um, so uh, it turned out, like, 10 meters from my home, uh, one of my friends, I didn't know him that well before. But he is a cardiologist uh, at the Artigani Health Network, and after that we started to you know chat each other, and you know he helped me to understand the the, the situation. Um, you know it's a very special situation right during COVID, um, and then uh, after a few weeks, and he said, "Hey Dean, uh, would would you like to work for me?" <laughs> and they said we have a lot of very good problems. We have a lot of data, and he knew I'm I'm a machine learning guy, AI person. Say, oh, you're 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 working a lot of different things, and we have the, the great problems, and that's when I cut in this healthcare uh, area and start work on health, uh, the cardiac problem, and actually I learned actually it's a it's a very important problem, you know the people who who uh, like the cardiac uh, disease is is the number one leading cause for for deaths in this country and also globally, uh, the number of fatalities is bigger than all the fatality related to cancer combined together. So it's, it's like 75% of the women has certain kind of cardiac problem in their lifelong uh, time. So yeah, so, so, so that's a really big problem. But it's actually very challenging because things will happen very fast. So I think that's exactly what robot and, and AI should really help in this case. Because we can now really you know, hire a person to follow everyone who has chest pain. That is not affordable. So yeah, I think uh, if I can think about something really big, and this is a, one of the... Um, like uh, uh, that, the problem that I really want to resolve for not only for my wife, uh, but for um, other people who have a similar problem. And luckily, my wife turned out to be just a normal um, symptom, but I'm sure many other people need to help at this stage. So given your extensive collaboration with, with industry leaders such okay. as like Google DeepMind, Toyota, and Amazon, um, yeah. how do you see the relationship between academia and industry evolving in the AI space? I see. Yeah, so that's that, that's a really interesting question uh, because these days um, it's different from like say 50 years ago. That um, we the, the biggest change is the time or the, the speed of invention innovation, right? So previously, you probably have when, when we start some some something some new idea at the beginning, and when this idea is deployed to the product, that usually take like multiple decades. Right, but now you can see how fast OpenAI did. Like mm -hmm. the first paper of Transformer, and then now, you know, the deployment. How how fast this OpenAI, this 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 idea influenced the world. I would say three years, four mm -hmm. years, right, five years. Um, so I think that's really interesting because it could be 
um, a very inter interesting situation. There's a one PhD student, when they join the program, they has a brilliant idea that nobody has thought about. Yeah. But when this PhD student graduates from the program, all the problem is already solved. <laughs> right? so, so, I mean, that, that really motivates us to invent a new ways of education, not only in the university, but across the university to the industry, because the industry is also doing innovation, doing research at this time. So how can we do research? And how to now link education, training, research, and deployment and product, and also get the feedback, right? So I think this is a really, we, we have an unprecedented uh, speed of innovation, really motivate us to um, get a new way of education. And that's what I'm working on uh, right now, and see how we can use a sponsored project to train students and have iterations with the industry partners all together. Um, but, well, we don't know the answer now, but we are, we are trying. <laughs> And then I also wanted to ask, in what ways you think AI can benefit society and where you see the greatest potential? Some people say, okay, they, AI has already saturated because we have already explored all the, exploited all the data on the internet. So there's no more things to, for us to use to train a high, in, higher intelligence um, uh, agent. Uh, but I think we, we really omit one important fact. That is, a text is not on only one format of information. Mm -hmm. And you know, with all this autonomy, autonomous um, robots, for example, cars, uh, you know, robots that serving people, um, and also uh, like healthcare diagnosis, those kind of things, uh, you know, we are generating gigantic amount of data. And this, I mean, we compare with what is on the internet. This is this is much larger because the sensor becomes much cheaper now. Mm -hmm. And we have so many people contribute to very diverse environment. I think, to me, uh, how AI will influence the society and how society will, you know, reshape AI is all through this interaction with the physical world, mm -hmm. right? So uh, I think as long as we can have certain way to, like, man uh, manage this unstructured data to be structured in some way, and then get the feedback of the human preference and human ethics back into the training. I think if we close this loop, we'll see the next wave of AI very soon. And this wave of AI, you know, the whole human civilization will be in the loop. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I can see about AI that I can understand the real world. Um, and also the real true AI that can help to uh, make a, a big change of the human life. Mm -hmm. How do you see the, um, the energy crisis kind of influencing the pace at which we innovate and um, the innovations which we're creating? Right. So yeah, excellent question. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. So we are now, um, we, we, we observe that a bigger and bigger uh, demand for energy, for computation, for data cleaning, and for data collection. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for example, as I said, the, those self-driving cars, the, the megawatt um, uh, like charging station. So usually those kind of station, they request, they have like 1,000 volt, uh, and uh, usually 3,000 uh, car, and current, so it's about three million watt, uh, you know, under consumption. So if that the for usually for heavy duty truck, so if that trucks come, you know, that that will actually create a big disturbance to the to the grid, uh, the electric grid. Right? How to really do that? I think very soon you'll see the the bottleneck of those uh, new robots and new uh, cars. Um, the bottleneck is now the technology, but actually the energy power of those uh, devices. And uh, uh, it's not only the number of charging stations, but actually the, the whole power energy system. Um, I think we, um, I have a project with uh, the Lawrence Berkeley um, National Lab, and we are actually analyzing the, not only California, but the, the, the whole nation's uh, power grid and how that interacts, for example, with the transportation, uh, particularly with the heavy um, electric truck. So I think that will be, definitely we'll, we'll see the more the importance of it, but I think by using um, optimization and you know smartly plan for the future, we should be able to solve the uh, the, the problem. Um, as uh, you know, we have more uh, different kind of formats of energy uh, that can be used in different situations. Mm -hmm. I think now it's way far. We are far away from optimal system. Thank you so much for all of your insights. Okay. It was amazing learning from you. And okay. thank you again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Okay.